Good evening. It's good to see you all tonight. You guys just let me know when you're done. Uh, John Bailey, you can dress him up, but you can't take him anywhere. <laughs> that's what Ruth says anyway. Yeah, that's right. He, oh, he didn't. Well, he must be a chimer. You know, Hugh started it, huh? I see fingers pointing backwards. Yeah. Age doesn't necessarily bring wisdom, does it, Hugh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we had a conference with our kindergarten teacher when David was in kindergarten. And uh, we went in there and we asked how he was doing. And, and our teacher said he was a chimer. He said, a chimer? Didn't really understand what that was. And uh, said, well, he hasn't started anything, but he's always willing to chime in. And so, uh, and that has pretty much held true his entire life. So I guess John was a chimer on that instance. He wasn't an instigator. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be down front in just a few minutes, and, and I'll go ahead and ask for forgiveness at that point in time. You'll send him down to join me, okay. <laughs> uh, good to see everyone tonight. I hope that you're doing well. It's been another great Lord's Day. We've been very blessed. Uh, we continue uh, to be blessed with, uh, uh, with visitors and with uh, people who are more interested in studying God's Word. And that is uh, uh, an old Southern saying, uh, when, when a, somebody comes to a preacher and says they want to study God's Word, it's like saying, sick em bulldog. And um, it's, a, it's an exciting thing. Um, I had one of our young men come up to me, uh, he, actually a young man, not a teenager, uh, come up to me this morning and says he would like to get together one day a week and start studying the Bible with me. Um, I mean, these are, these are just incredible uh, opportunities, and I, I'm very excited uh, about that. I'm excited about our youth intern that's coming. I, um, uh, my conversations with him have been outstanding, and uh, last week, um, we had a conference call, the elders and I did, and I kind of moderated uh, their discussion that they had with him to try to help them each to get an opportunity to speak with him, and uh, they were very impressed. We hung up the phone with him, and they wanted to know how quickly we could hire him, if that tells you how, uh, how impressive this young man is. Um, he has interned under uh, a man that I believe is the best youth minister in the Brotherhood. Uh, he's, his name is Jerry Elder. He's a year older than I am, and he's been a youth minister for over 30 years. And he is, he is still the best thing going. He's very sound. Uh, he really engages the young people. And this young man grew up in his youth group and interned with him the last two summers. So he's, he has some experience with that, and he also uh, has been a part of a very successful youth ministry. And so we're hoping that he can uh, bring some ideas and opportunities our way. We're very excited for that for our young people. Um, and th this is not the end. This is the beginning of this step. Uh, this is where it starts. Um, we have a lot of young people in this congregation. Uh, we went through and, and uh, looking down the roll, including some of our fringe teenagers, uh, the ones that we don't see very often uh, and don't see their parents very often, but they're still under the umbrella of members. We've got 18 teenagers in this congregation. 18. We've got two or three families that have been visiting us for several months now that have teenagers. And um, we, we have the, the makings of a very, of a very good group, a uh, good-sized group of teenagers. Then you go kindergarten through sixth grade, and we've got another 30 kids. And we need something for those kids to graduate into. It needs to be there waiting for them when they get there. It doesn't, we don't need to wait till they get there to start something. 
Um, and so he's going to be working, trying to help us get our teens cohesive and some opportunities for them. And then he's going to be working with the young families and their children also, helping to get them prepared so that when they get there, they're, they're on fire to just take off. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that all of us that are parents understand that there's, there comes a point in time when our, our children get to be teenagers and we become the stupidest people on earth as parents. And so they need somebody else to kind of help them out <laughs> along the way. Uh, Mark Twain once said that when he was 15, his dad was the dumbest man that he ever met. And when he was 21, he was surprised how much he had learned in six short years. Um, so, you know, we as teenagers, you know, we, we stop looking to our parents so much as we did when we were younger. And they need some people to look up to. Uh, other members, other adults in the church, but uh, especially if there's uh, someone there who's dedicated to helping them. That's, that's also very helpful. We are in uh, Kings tonight in our survey through the, the Bible. Uh, just as we did last week with Samuel, uh, First and Second Kings is one book in its original form. Uh, it was divided up into two books to make it a little bit more digestible. And so we're going to study Kings as a single unit even though we will break it up into First and Second Kings looking through the book itself. And we'll do the same thing with Chronicles uh, next week. Um, we are, are blessed to have the books that we have. We have about 500 some odd years of history in Kings. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful story. It's not always a good ending, but it's a beautiful story because it's God's story of his people. And it's certainly worth uh, us spending time in and learning from what we see there. Would you please pray with me as we begin? Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. We thank you for being our God, for, provide, for providing us salvation through your son Jesus, and for granting us time and opportunity, Father, for being patient with us until we came to an understanding of how it is that we can be in a right relationship with you. Thank you for that. Father, we, we're indebted to you for your word, for the instruction and the guidance and the encouragement that we receive from that. And as we look into this beautiful book of Kings tonight, we ask you for the same. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look throughout our Old Testaments, we continue to be reminded of what Paul wrote to the Roman Christians, Romans 15 and verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and the comfort of the Scripture, might have hope. The things written before of which he speaks are what we now call the Old Testament. And so it's written for our learning. You know, we, we often find ourselves... Uh, well, we don't follow the Old Testament. Well, we do follow the Old Testament. We do. We don't follow the ceremonial aspects of the Old Testament, but certainly we follow the Old Testament. Because when you look at the apostles and the things that are written in the New Testament, there's a whole lot of Old Testament there uh, that's written to help us out. So we have to understand what we're talking about when we say we do or don't follow something. Uh, the ceremonial aspects of the Old Testament... Uh, the sacrifices, the worship, the priesthood, the incense, all of these things, we, we've graduated from those into a better covenant. But when you think about the nature of God, has the nature of God changed from the Old to the New Testament? No, God never changed, did he? We learn a lot about God's nature from the Old Testament. Um, has God's moral law changed? No, it was wrong to murder, as we saw in Genesis chapter 4 this morning in class. Wrong to murder under the patriarchal age, wasn't it? Was it wrong to murder, murder under the Mosaic age? Is it wrong to murder under the Christian age? Absolutely. So God's moral law hasn't changed. So when we look at ideas like adultery, lying, stealing, murder, those things never change. Those are rooted in the nature of God. And since God doesn't change, his moral law doesn't change. We learn many of those things. As we go back, we learn how, how God has expected people to respond to him over the course of time that helps us to respond to him in a more favorable way under the new covenant. So where there's much for us to learn, there are things for us 
uh, to understand from the Old Testament. And here we find ourselves in the beautiful book of Kings. First and second Kings is going to be our subject for this evening. Uh, unknown author or authors, um, considering that it covers uh, the length of time that it does, it probably wasn't written in one sitting. Uh, as a matter of fact, it could have been written over any number of years. Uh, it was obviously written under the guidance of God. It is inspired by him, regardless of if it is one individual or 20 people responsible for putting this history together for us. Uh, it very well could have been some scribes and others, uh, maybe even some of the prophets who were responsible for writing this. It was written shortly before 587 B.C., which is when Judah was carried off into Babylonian captivity. With the exception of chapters 24 and 25 of 2 Kings, uh, because of the, the content there, that those uh, were recorded during the captivity. The purpose of 1 Kings, and we're going to divide it up here to, to see one of the reasons why it's divided like it is, uh, is to give an account of the reigns of the kings uh, from Solomon to Jehoshaphat in Judah and Azahiah in Israel. Remember, after Solomon, we had a division that took place. And the ten northern tribes went one way, and the southern tribes went their way. Second Kings gives an account of the reigns of the kings from uh, uh, Azahiah in the north and Jehoram in the south until the fall of each of those kingdoms. Uh, 721, 722 for the northern kingdom, uh, 587 is the finality of the southern kingdom, uh, both of those in B.C. So we, we see them running side by side with each other for a period of time, and then Israel is no more, and we just have Judah and its functionality. In 1 Kings, we see uh, the history and reign of Solomon in the first 11 chapters. Then we see the history of the kingdoms of Judah and Israel going through uh, the end of chapter 22. With the reign of Solomon, uh, it begins with the death of David. David was, uh, was our hero, as it were. When the Jews look back, they, they always look back to the time of David. There's a reason Jerusalem is called the city of David. There is a reason that the symbol on the flag of Israel even today is called the Star of David. He is their hero. And there's a reason why throughout, even up until the time uh, of Christ, that the throne was referred to as David's throne. Uh, he is the one to whom they look, and so it's no mistake that it begins with David and the ascension of Solomon. In the early years, chapters 3 through uh, the middle part of chapter 10, we see Solomon exercising wisdom and discrimination. God said, ask for me um, on behalf of your father, I will give you whatever you want. He asked for wisdom. And, and because he got wisdom... God granted him all of the other things he could have asked for. We see the building of the temple. David was prohibited from building the temple because he was a man who had shed blood. He was a man of war. Um, and we see what many refer to as the golden age of Israel in these early chapters. Uh, the borders had expanded. The wealth was unbelievable that was pouring into the country. The latter years of Solomon, beginning the middle part of chapter 10 and going through chapter 11, we see extravagant luxury. They allowed the wealth to begin to influence them, and he did for himself. Uh, a notorious sensuality, an obsession almost, and we see apostasy from God taking place. In the history of Judah and Israel, we see the disruption of the kingdom by Rehoboam uh, take place. And then the ten northern tribes rebel, and they make Jeroboam the king of Israel. And in this split, we see major problems taking place. Um, 
when we have the place of worship changing, we have the object of worship changing, and we have the priest of worship changing, all in violation of what God had told the children of Israel to do. The northern tribes, um, Jeroboam uh, decided that if the people continue to go to Jerusalem, they may, may like Rehoboam better than they liked him. And so he said, oh, it's so hard for you to travel down there. We'll just, we'll just stay up here. We'll, we'll make this easy. And, um, and it led to their demise. We see uh, comparative history of the two kingdoms, chapters 12 through 22. And uh, this king was reigning while this king was reigning. And then we just see it shifting going all the way through the two nations until we get to 2 Kings. In 2 Kings, the first uh, couple of chapters, we see the, the history of the last days of Elijah, the prophet. Uh, we see the history of Elisha, who was ordained by Elijah. And you'll notice there's a couple of verse overlap between those two because that is the, the point in time where um, the torch was passed, so to speak. Then we see in chapters 13 through 17 the reigns of the evil kings of Israel and ultimately the Assyrian captivity uh, where the northern tribes are carried off. Chapters 18, 18 through 20 we see good king Hezekiah. Uh, he did some, some wonderful things. Uh, we see, we could spend all day talking about Hezekiah, but we need to obviously move on. The evil reign of Manasseh. Good King Josiah comes in and restores worship. He was the boy king, but as he grew, I'm telling you, he was, uh, he was, he was quite the king. Then we have a series of evil kings that lead to the Babylonian captivity and the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem. That's how the basic outline falls. Now, if we're going to read these, obviously we're going to be here a while. Uh, but I wanted to bring you a lesson that I think is uh, very pertinent to Christians in 2017. And there are quite a few that we could glean from the text. There's, there's no question of that. But there's one in particular that has always struck me. Um, and, and I think no matter where you live and the time that you live, it's going to be a pertinent lesson. And so I'd invite you to join me in 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to look at the first 18 verses of the text. This is following um, Elijah defeating the prophets of Baal and having them all executed. Great, great victory. For God, encouragement for Elijah, and for the people of Israel. Okay. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make it your life as the life of one of them, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and he ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and he ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Oreb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. 
and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because of the children of Israel, excuse me, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint uh, Ahazel, excuse me, Haziel, as king over Syria, and you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. May God bless the reading of his word. What a beautiful story that is. What in the world happened to Elijah? What had, what had he just done? He's having this pity party. Oh, woe is me. Right after he's had a blast making fun of Baal and the prophets. And then God consumes the altar that is soaked in water. Consumes the other altar and then those prophets are killed. That, that should have been a sign to Elijah that he was going to be all right. But as soon as he hears Jezebel, he runs. He runs for his life. Look at what he says in verse 4. He prayed that he might die. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. A little bit further down in verse 9, God comes to him and says, What are you doing here? Why, why are you here? You're not supposed to be here. But what does he say? I've been ve very zealous. The children of Israel have forsaken you. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. I alone am left. How many times have we said that? There's nobody faithful in the church but me. I'm the, I'm the last one. I'm the only one over there that cares about anything. You know, there are times in our life where we feel that way. You know, we, we, we either overinflate our importance to the Lord or we fail to recognize the importance of others. And whichever it is, uh, Elijah had that problem. Now, remember, there are two people that God did not allow to experience death. Enoch's one of them. Who's the other one? The man that's having the pity party. So even though he's having this pity party, he still w found favor with God in the end. A pity party, when we get ourselves in the doldrums like this, should not be the end of our spiritual lives. We can't allow it to defeat us. 
There are mountaintop experiences where we wipe out the prophets of Baal, but there are also going to be valley and cave experiences in our spiritual life. Times when things don't go so well. If you've been around for very long and you've done very much, you've experienced those times. And they're not fun. God comes to him in the wind, in the earthquake, and in the fire. He creates, he, he causes all of those things to happen, but he wasn't himself in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. He spoke to him in a still, small voice. The God that can make those other things happen and then speak gently to you is a God you want to serve. He's he's a God who can make things happen. Verses 15 through 17, God tells him there's still a lot of work to do. I'm not done with you yet. She can't hurt you. Because you're my servant. I'm, I've, I've got you doing my job. You have kings to appoint, and you have a prophet to take your place that you need to appoint. Jezebel can't stop that. And he reminds him of something that we need to be reminded of. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, who, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal you know there's there's some difficulties in the church today um, most of it's self-inflicted wounds and I'm talking about the the church at large we have uh, self-professed experts in the body of Christ that have found that the Bible doesn't mean what it says And have convinced people that the Bible doesn't mean what it says. That there are directions the church needs to go in and things we need to do that are not authorized by the scripture. And they they find evidence of these things in some of the most peculiar places, which you have to really strain to, to make them say those things. As a result of that, there has been an equal turn the other way and people shouting in publications and in sermons and other things that the sky is falling. You know, the, the church is gone. The, the, ch- the church is gone. When I announce to people in Kentucky and other friends back in the Bible Belt knew that I was coming here, they thought I'd lost my mind. There aren't any Christians out there yeah, because they don't know. I, I told them, and, and I already knew this before, I, I would never have even come and looked into this situation if I didn't know, but the, there are a few churches that have lost their minds out here. The church is not large here, but most of the churches that are out here are pretty decent churches trying to do the right thing. You know, we may have a difference, a little difference here, a little difference there, but most of them have not brought in women preachers and a pipe organ, you know, and are doing interpretive dance in their worship services. Most of them are not doing that. Most of them are, you know, pretty much just trying to follow what the Bible says. But you know, those of us who do the right thing don't make the headlines, do we? Who makes the headlines? The people that are going off the rails. And so we have uh, one individual down in Texas, and his, his ring of fellowship has gotten so small that I don't even know if he's in it anymore. Uh, he has disfellowshipped almost everybody in the brotherhood. And he's the only faithful person left. You know, it's sad. You know, there's 1.3 million members of the churches of Christ in the United States. I doubt he's the only one left that's following the Bible out of 1.3 million. Now, of those 1.3 million, that includes some of our brothers and sisters that have gone off to the left. It also has some of them that are super hard right. But most of them, when you look in that number, 
are pretty much down the middle. You don't ever hear anything about them. The church in Davidson County, Tennessee, Davidson County is now Nashville. It's the metropolitan area. The entire county is Nashville now. There are 109 congregations in the county. 109. There are 15 that have gone ultra-liberal. Instruments, all kinds of stuff like that. 19. Do the math. That still leaves 90 congregations that haven't done that. And you know what you hear from everybody outside of that area? Well, the church is gone in Nashville. It's gone. You see, we have the same problem that Elijah had. I'm the only one that's left. And when we see bad things happening, we think we're the only ones who, who can do the right thing. We're the only ones that are left to do the right thing. And God reminds Elijah, and he reminds us, there are other like-minded people out there who want to do the right thing. And you know, there are people who are outside the body of Christ that want to do the right thing too. I've studied with some of them, and in tears, they look at what the Bible teaches and says, I've been looking for that my whole life. And they come into the body of Christ. We cannot give in to the Elijah pessimism that he was experiencing. We cannot allow those things. You know, right now we're, we're in a growth time. But there's going to come a time when it might not be as exciting and it might not be as energetic and it might not be as encouraging. And it might just be a time where we just got to take our breath and go, whew, and then get back to work. But we can't allow ourselves to give in to pessimism. We can't do it. Um, I, I promise you something. As long as I'm in the pulpit here, there won't be women serving in services. There won't be instruments here. Uh, there won't be dancing in the aisles. There won't be any of that silliness taking place because I'm not going to stand for it. I, I will, if somebody tries to do that, I will preach against it and the elders will have to kick me out of here if that's what they want to happen. I don't believe these elders want that to happen. But I'm telling you, I, I don't stand for that. At the same time, I don't stand for pulling hard the other way either in response to what's happening over there. I, I don't care what anybody's doing. I just want to be the Lord's man and I want to follow what the Bible says. That's all I want. And, you know, we, that's where we've got to be. And if we want that, God's going to bless us. He's going to bless us if we want that. Don't give in to the pessimism. You know, there are going to be times where things are just not as good, but I'm telling you, we've got to focus on the God who's in control. There is a God who is in control. And no matter what you think about the man in the White House or the man that just left the White House, I'm going to tell you God's in control. Paul tells us that there's no authority except that that is given by God. And he's writing that when Nero was emperor. Nero, if you haven't studied lately, was not a nice guy. Um, may, made our, our current and former president look like choir boys. Seriously. So, if God's in charge, God's in charge. Let God be in charge. Let's, let's get to doing God's work. Because there are others just like us that have not bowed the knee to Baal. I'm telling you, you go to Guyana, and you've got brothers and sisters down there that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You go to the Philippines, where I went over and taught Philippine Theological College back at the end of 2014, and there are brothers and sisters there. There's 7,000 there that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And I imagine we've got some in Slovakia and wherever else that you may have done mission work or encouragement. And I'm telling you, there's people all over the United States that have not bowed the knee to Baal. There's a lot of them. 
and they don't make a lot of noise. You know why? Because they're busy doing the Lord's work instead of having everybody look at them or instead of having things go off in a certain direction uh, that is an extreme to the right or an extreme to the left or whatever it may be. We need to be encouraged by that. Paul, uh, God is seeking to encourage Elijah. In, in Israel now, remember, the ten northern tribes were not godly people. They weren't Judah. They didn't have Hezekiahs and Josiahs. They had ungodly kings, but they also had prophets that went and prophesied to them. And what God is saying is there were people that were listening to the prophets. There were people who were listening to the prophets that had not bowed the knee to Baal. Even in a country that was going to be carried off into captivity in 722, 721 B.C. by the Assyrians. We have a God who is sovereign and a God who is in control. And I'm not talking about moving around all of us like pawns on a chessboard, but ultimately God's in control. He's in charge. He's still in charge. He's still God. He's still on his throne. And we can never lose sight of that. So instead of giving into the pessimism, I would invite you to go to Philippians chapter 4. Very familiar two verses here. But this is God's encouragement to the Christians in Philippi and by extension down the years to us. Through the Apostle Paul, he writes these words, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me these do and the God of peace will be with you what is Paul under God, uh, God's hand instructing the Philippian Christians to do think good thoughts focus on the good you got to deal with the bad, that's fine, but don't focus on the bad. You focus on the good. You focus on the things that are right. Meditate on those things. And follow the good examples that you see. Whether it's a brother or a sister in Christ here, an example that we read within the Scripture, whatever it may be, follow the good examples. And don't be encouraged by the bad ones or discouraged by the bad ones. It goes against human nature because what is it that we want to focus on? Well, all you have to do is look at the nightly news, and you can see what sells. How many times have they begun a news broadcast? Uh, our lead story today is no planes crashed anywhere in the world. Have you ever seen that as a lead story? Do you know that, that there are days that go by that no planes crash? you know why you don't know that? Because that's not the lead story. But when one does crash, what do you hear? That's all you hear is about the plane crash. And the, the, the technician that worked on the airplane that mistreats his dog and everything else, right? That's what they want to focus on. God is telling us focus on the good. Focus on the things that are true and lovely and pure and praiseworthy. Focus on the things that are noble. Focus on the good good things and follow the right examples because when we give into pessimism that's a cancer and it's hard to get rid of it's very hard to get rid of God has blessed us in this place and in this time let's focus on our blessings let's focus on the future and let's not get weighted down by the negative things that Satan's going to throw our way He's going to do it. Because anytime somebody's doing something good for God, you know Satan's not far away. Because he's going to try to mess it up. There's a Jezebel out there somewhere that's going to try to do something to us. We are blessed. God has blessed us richly. Let's bless each other and bless him in return. We serve an awesome God. 
a God that loves us, a God who gave his son for us so that we could live. If you're here tonight, you haven't named the name of Jesus, I'm going to ask you a question. Why not? What's holding you back? What is holding you back? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? That's good, but that's a start. That's not where you finish. Are you, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God? That's good, but that's not the end of it either. Have you turned from the sins Jesus died for in your life, repented of those things? Maybe you have, but you're still not finished. Have you been conformed to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins and raised to walk in a new life? If you have, guess what? You're still not finished. You've put on Christ. You've become a New Testament Christian, but now you get to walk faithfully until the end. You see, we're never finished. And too many people want to think they get to the finish line. And folks, our finish line is either when our heart stops beating or the Lord returns. That's our finish line. And so we stay faithful till then, till death. We don't have to do it for any particular period of time, just our life. That's it. If you're willing to do that tonight, we'd love to help you. Gene's prepared a song for us, and we're going to sing that here in just a moment. If you've made those steps and you're trying your best to do the things that God has called for you to do and maybe some discouragement has set in, maybe there's an illness, uh, maybe there's a sin that's come into your life, I don't know. Uh, but we'd love to pray with you and pray for you and encourage you in some way. But whatever you need, won't you come as together we stand and as we sing.